Well, good evening, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to our second Monday night Bible study, Ferndale Church of the Word. And we're just going to continue where we left off last time, just going through the Bible one week at a time. And so the chapters we're going to cover this time are Joshua chapter 9 through Judges chapter 5. Uh, just a little um, housekeeping issue, I guess I should say. Last time I didn't... Uh, I don't. I didn't have the, since I'm still new to this UStream thing. I didn't have the chat where I could see it, and so if there were any questions, uh, I didn't get to them. I apologize because I didn't see them, but I do have the, it up now. So uh, probably it'd be best if you do have questions, we'll just wait till the end, and you can just type in your question, and then I'll uh, try my best to answer it. So let's go ahead and get started. We'll uh, go ahead and turn to Joshua chapter nine where we left off last time. If you remember, uh, right when we start the book of Joshua, you have the nation of Israel. They've uh, Moses has died at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, gave the children of Israel that new generation, not the one that was 40 years in the wilderness, but the, their children that came out of that wilderness, gave them the law, uh, second reading of the law. That's why it's called Deuteronomy, the second reading. Second given in the law, I should say. And then you have Joshua leading the leading Israel into the promised land. And in chapter 6, you had the uh, walls of Jericho come down. They defeat Jericho. Uh, chapter 7, you had one of the men in the army, Achan, who took some of the possession of the, of the spoils from Jericho for himself. And as a result, they lost in a battle against the nation of Ai. And uh, then after Achan was stoned to death for that, uh, he was the accursed thing in, in the midst of a holy nation. God can't dwell. Being a holy God cannot dwell among unholy things. And so he was, uh, the unholy thing was put away. And when that, was ha when that happened, then they took over Ai. And so now we start in chapter 9 with the Gibeonites. And so we're just going to start uh, reading here in one Joshua chapter 9, verse 1. It says, And it came to pass, when all the kings which were on this side, Jordan, and the hills, and in all the coast of the great sea, over against Lebanon, the Hittite, and the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, heard thereof, said so they heard about the victory, that they gathered themselves together to fight with Joshua and with Israel with one accord. And when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done unto Jericho and to Ai, they did work wildly, and went and made as if they had been ambassadors, and took old sacks upon their asses, and wine bottles, old and rent, and bound up, and old shoes, and clouded upon their feet, and old garments upon them, and all the bread of their provision was dry and moldy. And they went to Joshua and to the camp at Gilgal, and said unto him, and to the men of Israel, We be come from a far country, now therefore make ye a league with us. So you have the men of uh, of the Gibeonites and they come to Joshua and they pretend they're a neighboring country they're part of what you had in verse 1 the Hivite, Amorite, Canaanite all those nations that God had told Israel to utterly they had already been judged by God they were to be destroyed and Gibeon was part of that uh, but they make they make themselves out to be like they're not part of those Canaanite nations, but rather they come from a far country. So they put on these, uh, you know, old shoes and old clothes, like they came with a great journey, and they're trying to make a peace treaty or a league with the nation of Israel. And and you see, let's see, they uh, the problem is if you look down in verse uh, fourteen uh, with Israel, it says the men and the men took of their victuals and ask not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. So they didn't ask the Lord about these Gibeonites, should, what should we do? Rather, they, they took up the, the, the gifts that the Gibeonites had brought to Israel, and they ended up in verse 15, Joshua made peace with them and made a league with them to let them live, and the princes of the congregation swear unto them. So you have the nation of Gibeon who should be destroyed, but they make themselves out to be like they came from a far country, and they end up making Israel makes a league with them. And I want to go back, if you hold your place there, Joshua chapter 9, I want to go back to Deuteronomy chapter 20, 
because this is really where God gives Israel a guide as to what they're supposed to do once they get in the promised land what they are to do with these nations so if we go back to Deuteronomy chapter 20 and we'll look at verse 10 there are really two different categories or groups of nations that God identifies here in in Deuteronomy 20 uh, verse 10 it says when thou comest nigh unto a city to fight against it then proclaim peace unto it and it shall be if it make the answer of peace and open unto thee then it shall be that all the people that is found therein shall be tributaries unto thee and they shall serve thee and if it will make no peace with thee but will make war against thee then thou shalt besiege it so that's the first group God says these particular nations if you um, you go against them, you give them a chance. They could become servants, they could be uh, you know, tributaries, pay you tribute, and as a result, they can do uh, what they can fulfill their part as Gentiles of the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis chapter 12, where God says, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. So this is their chance. They, If they curse Israel by saying, no, we're not going to have peace with you, we want to go to war with you, well then they're going to be cursed by God according to the Abrahamic covenant. But if they say, yes, we will serve you, we will pay tribute to you, then they will bless Israel, and then they will be blessed in return. But there's a second group. In verse 16, it says, But of the cities of these people, which the Lord thy God doth give thee for an inheritance, thou shalt save alive nothing that breatheth, but thou shalt utterly destroy them, namely the Hittites and the Amorites, the Canaanites and the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee, that they teach you not to do after all their abominations which the gods, so should ye sin against the Lord your God. So the promised land, the people in the promised land, those Canaanites and all the, all the ites listed there, they're the ones that Israel is not supposed to try to make a peace treaty with them. They're supposed to utterly destroy them. God has already judged them. And so if we go back to chapter 9 of the book of Joshua, that's where we are in terms of the Gibeonites. They are one of those nations, they are part of the Amorites and the Hittites, etc., that God has said to utterly destroy. So when they come to Joshua, they come to Israel, Israel should have inquired of the Lord to see which one of those groups they fall into. And then they would have found out that they are of the land, the promised land that God had promised to the nation of Israel. And as such, they should be utterly destroyed. They should not make a peace treaty. Uh, but instead, they make this peace treaty. And as a result, um, you have, have um, you know, those people are going to survive. And it's interesting. I just wonder, I mean, we don't know for sure, but I just wonder if the Gibeonites... Uh, Head the book of Deuteronomy. If they read that passage, or at least heard about that passage there, and if they, you know, read about Deuteronomy chapter 20, and that's why they did this to show that they're from a far country and to make a, to try to get Israel to make a league with them. Um, it's just, uh, you know, fascinating. I don't know if that's the case or not, but it's just interesting to think, you know, why, why did the nice did this? Certainly, it shows that they at least feared Israel, whether or not they feared him because the Lord was with them. We don't know. Uh, probably, though, because the men of Jericho, Jericho, uh, as Rahab said back in Joshua chapter 6, that all of Jericho was fear, fearful of Israel. They knew what God had done in defeating Egypt and going through the Red Sea, and they were afraid of what God would do through Israel uh, to the nation of Jericho. So uh, it's quite possible that the Gibeonites had chapter 20 or at least read about it and decided, hey, let's, you know, according to what God says, we're going to be utterly destroyed. So let's go ahead and see if we can uh, fall into this other group of nations that are far away and then make uh, a peace treaty so that we're not destroyed. Not sure if that's what it did, but it's interesting that could be the case. So that's what you have in chapter 9. And then in chapter 10, you have a, a confederacy comes up because Israel is prospering. They didn't defeat the Gibeonites because of their trickery, but they've defeated Jericho. They defeated Ai. The, their popularity, their reputation is spreading. And so when you get to chapter 10, you have a league of five Amorite kings that come to destroy, um, actually, they come to destroy Gibeon. 
uh, let's see, uh, verse 1 there, chapter 10, verse 1 of Joshua. Now it came to pass when Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, had heard how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it, as he had done to Jericho and her king, so he had done to Ai and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them. So they find out Gibeon is part of them. Now look at verse 4. After he gathers together a few of the kings, you've got five kings of the Amorites. Verse 4, it says, Come up unto me and help me that we may smite Gibeon, for it hath made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. Therefore the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon, gathered themselves here and went up they and all their host, and encamped before Gibeon, and made war against it. So you have them coming up against Gibeon, and uh, and basically Gibeon then, uh, verse 6 says, And the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua to the camp to Gilgal, saying, Slack not thy hand from thy servants. Come up to us quickly, and save us, and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. Israel had made this peace treaty with Gibeon. They found out later that Gibeon is really close by. They shouldn't have made it, but uh, it's too late. They've made a covenant. Uh, they can't break it, and so they're supposed to protect Gibeon, and so they come to their aid. But it's it's really the Lord who does this, uh, of course, because that's really where Israel's power comes from. All that Israel has is from the Lord. And so if you look down in verse 11, you have uh, the Lord fighting for Gibeon on behalf of the nation of Israel so that these kings are destroyed. Uh, chapter 10 verse 11 And it came to pass as they fled from before Israel and were in the going down to Beth Horam that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Azekah and they died. There They were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. So, so it shows you that it's not Israel who is winning the great victory. They're doing what they can, but they're few in, in people compared to these other ones. Well, I shouldn't say that. They've got a couple million people, but their army isn't that great. They don't have uh, all 600 and some thousand men that are able to go to war or act war. Uh, there, so in that respect, army versus army, Israel's a lot smaller. And so, and it's by design with the Lord that he, because the Lord is to get the glory. It's God's nation. God is doing the fighting. He doesn't want Israel saying, look what I have done. Look at the land that I've possessed. Look at the things I've done. Red, it's all the glory going to the Lord. And so that's, and so the Lord kills more people of the, these five kings of the Amorites than Israel does themselves. Uh, note that he kills them with hailstones. Uh, that's a part of nature that he uses. And we'll get into more of that later. You'll see that uh, God, he sometimes does use swords or has the swords where the, the enemy just, they end up killing their own selves with their own swords or the angel of the Lord comes and he slays a bunch of people. But a lot of times God does it through nature and through his creation. And he uses hailstones here to uh, kill these uh, these five Amorite nations that come against Israel and, and Gibeon. And we'll go over that in more detail later as to uh, why that's the case. Uh, but just note here the Lord fights for him. And also in verse 12 you have one of these miracles. Um, it's pretty amazing. Then said Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, Stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Agilon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of, hev of heaven, and hasted not to go down about a whole day. Now look at verse 14. And there was no day like that before it or after it, that the Lord hearken unto the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. So the Lord, it's very clear that this is Israel is God's nation. They're chosen as God's holy nation to be that kingdom of priests, to reconcile the rest of the back to God. And God fights for them with hailstones. And then when Israel is doing their fighting, God uses nature again, uh, having the sun and the moon stand still for about a whole day. Uh, which has never happened before, as verse 14 says, and it's never happened. It'll never happen again. Um, that the Lord hearken unto the voice of a man to do that. It shows that God is dwelling among Israel, and that God is fighting for them. 
and that he will give them that promised land and he will take care of their enemies. So then if we go down to uh, verse 28 through 43, uh, we won't go through this um, in detail, but this is basically where the nation of Israel, they're conquering more territory. That's, what we, that's the section of the book of Joshua we're in. They're conquering the territory of the promised land. And in these verses, chapter 10, verses 28 through 43, there are several nations in the southern part of the promised land that they utterly destroy. And you can read that on their own time. It looks like three or six, eight, approximately eight nations that are destroyed. And so that's in the south. Then we go to chapter 11, and there you have fighting in the northern realm. And... Uh, starting in verse 1 it says and it came to pass when Jabin king of Hazor had heard those things that he sent to Jobab king of Maiden and to the king of Shimron and to the king of Ashshaf and to the kings that were on the north of the mountains and of the plains south of Sinaroth and in the valley and in the borders of Dor on the west and to the Canaanite on the east and on the west and to the Amorite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Jebusite in the mountains and to the Hivite upon or Hivite under Hermon in the land of Mizpah and they went out they and all their hosts with them much people even as the sand that is upon the seashore in multitude with horses and chariots very many and when all these kings were met together they came and pitched together at the waters of Merim to fight against Israel so Israel is conquering territories. They through Jericho, Ai. Now they've uh, conquered all the the five of the Amorites. They've conquered all these southern territories. These um, nine or so nations, and so now are eight that I've identified there. And so now the northern key, the northern people are getting afraid. They're saying, you know, Israel, they're just taking over this land. We got to get together. And so this is the point of reading these verses. Is this is a strong confederacy. This isn't an army of, say, a thousand people or, you know, these men, remember, the men in Canaan, when the spies went out in Numbers 14, they were afraid to go into the land because they said these men are giants. You know, they're really tall people. Remember Goliath and a couple others who were, you know, 10 feet and upwards, you know, huge guys. And they brought back that cluster of grapes. It took two men to carry it back. I mean, you've got huge people and you've got, as verse 4 here, Joshua chapter 11 says, um, much people even as the sand that is upon the seashore and multitude with horses and chariots very many so you've got giants you've got innumerable amount of people like the sand on the seashore and they're well equipped they've got horses they've got chariots I mean they are ready to fight they've come to fight they see Israel as a great threat having taken over the southern part and they've come to fight and they vastly I would assume outnumber uh, the Lord's the Lord's army, the nation of Israel here. But it doesn't matter because if the Lord is fighting for Israel, these people, no matter how great they are, how big they are, don't stand a chance. As the Bible says, if God be for us, who can be against us? And God is for the nation of Israel at this time. And so look at verse 6. It says, And the Lord said unto Joshua, Be not afraid because of them, for tomorrow about this time will I deliver them up all slain before Israel. Thou shalt hoe their horses and burn their chariots with fire. So Joshua came and all the people of war with him against them by the waters of Merim suddenly, and they fell upon them, and the Lord delivered to the hand of Israel. So it wasn't Israel's doing it, it was them, who smote them and chased them unto great Zidon and unto Mizraphoth Maim and unto the valley of Mizpah eastward, and they smote them until they left them none remaining. Note here, even if even if Israel, let's say for the sake of argument, if Israel was just, you know, had millions and millions and millions of people and they had superior war uh, weapons of war and all this, um, what you would end up happening if if it was if God wasn't involved in this is just man against man, you would have Israel would still would have won in this case, but they would have had casualties, you know, because you're going against giants and all these people, and it would have taken a long time. But the point is, Israel is outnumbered. And still, the Lord gives them victory, total victory. You don't find any casualties among Israel. All these people, who knows, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, probably, are all killed by the Lord, and it's all within a day. Verse 6 said, uh, And the Lord said unto Joshua, Be not afraid, because of them for this time will I deliver up all slain before Israel. And God keeps his promise 
the last part of verse 8, until they, and they smote them until they left them none remaining. So the point is, it's clear here, it's not, by, it's not by might or by power, but by God's Spirit. It's the Lord fighting for the nation of Israel. He promised them, he promised Abraham close to 500 years ago, probably 450 or so years ago, that he would give, give the nation of Israel the land, this promised land. He gave the borders. He said, Abraham, walk around this land, see the borders, walk around it. This is your land. I'm giving it to you and your seed. And it didn't matter that there are giants. It didn't matter that there are all these people in the land. God's fighting for them, and so God takes care of them. And so there's a great victory here, one. So they've already conquered the south. Now conquers the north and they do it in one day because God does it for them now down to verse 21 here Israel destroys the Anakims it says, then came Joshua and cut off the Anakims from the mountains from Hebron from Deborah from Anab and from all the mountains of Judah and from all the mountains of Israel Joshua destroyed them utterly with their cities there was none of the Anakims left in the land of the children of Israel only in Gaza and Gath and in Ashdod there remained so they did conquer all um, but they conquered all that the Lord gave into their hands. And later on we'll go into why they didn't conquer everybody all at once. Um, and we get to another another place here. But the point is, they are Israel has taken over the promised land. They, they were in bondage for 400 years in Egypt. They were in the wilderness for 40 years. Now is their time. God is Now the time is right for God to fulfill His plan through the nation of Israel. And so He's giving them the land. Uh, then in ver chapter 12, uh, verses 1 through 6, it just gives you a list here. It's sort of uh, going back. In fact, let's, get, let's go to chapter 11 there, verse 23, the last, the last sentence there. And 11, it says, And the land rested from war. So you have them conquering the south, the north. You know, there, there's not much left, but there are some cities here that they haven't conquered, and we'll go into that a little later. So now, in chapter 12, now we're going back, sort of, and um, just going through like a summary of exactly who the nation of Israel has conquered. And so, uh, verses 1 through 6 give you a list of the kings that defeated king. Actually, the whole chapter 12 is all a list of kings and nations that were defeated by the nation of Israel. Verses 1 through 6 cover the kings that were defeated on the other side of Jordan. Remember, there are 12 tribes of Israel, and before they got to Jordan, they did defeat some giants, um, some nations before they crossed over, and then there were two and a half tribes of Israel that decided they wanted to settle there before they even crossed Jordan. Um, those tribes still went over and crossed Jordan and helped the other nine and a half tribes fight in the land, uh, but that was they, um, Moses went ahead and gave it to them for possession and their wives and children stayed there while, we, while they went into the promised land to fight. So verses 1 through 6 of chapter 12 of the book of Joshua tells you the names of those kings that were defeated before they got to Jordan and then the rest of the chapter uh, verses 7 through 24 give you a list of the kings that were defeated uh, in the promised land after they crossed Jordan and there are, we won't go in, into the names, but there are 31 kings in all. So that's giving you a summary of the nations or the cities that have been conquered uh, before they got to Jordan and then after Jordan. And now when you get to chapter 13, you're told of the land that is yet to be conquered. Verse 1, it says, now Joshua, this is a Joshua chapter 13, verse 1. Now Joshua is old and stricken in years, and the Lord said unto him, Thou art old and stricken in years. That's pretty good assessment there and there remaineth yet very much land to be possessed so it's not over yet God's given them, he's given them uh, the south and the north but not every city every nation in it um, and so then he goes over it says in verse 2 this is the land that yet remaineth all the borders of the Philistines and all Geshurai and then it goes on uh, from there listing all these lands now let's have the very very interesting here in verse 6 it says, uh, still going through the list of the land that's to be conquered, it says, All the inhabitants of the hill country from Lebanon unto Misrafath Maim and all the Sidonians, them will I drive out from before the children of Israel. So they haven't been done yet. But notice the last verse, Only divide, divide thou it by lot unto the Israelites for an inheritance as I have commanded thee. 
Now therefore divide this land for an inheritance unto the nine tribes and the half tribe of Manasseh. So Joshua, as the first verse says, he's old and stricken in years. He's coming to the point where he's about to die. And God says, uh, if I, hold your place there. Let's go back to the first chapter of Joshua. This is where God gives the commission to Joshua of what he's supposed to do when he gets to the promised land. Um, and this should help clarify what's going on in chapter 13. So in Joshua chapter 1 verse 6, this is the Lord speaking unto Joshua. And he says, uh, God says to Joshua, Be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. So God swore the promised land. He swore it to Abraham. He says, this, these are the borders of the promised land. I'm giving it to the nation of Israel. And here at the beginning of Joshua, God gives the commission to Joshua. It says, it's your job, Joshua, to divide the land among all the nation of Israel. And it says there in the last part, it says, the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. So when we're in Joshua chapter 13, a lot of the land has been conquered, but as the verse, verse of Joshua chapter 13 says, yet very much land remaineth to be possessed. But yet Joshua's job wasn't to just divide the land that had been conquered already, but it was to divide all the land that, had been prom that God had promised to the fathers. And so here he is at the end of his life, and God says, even though here's, here's a list of all the land that still needs to be conquered, you know, but it's not going to happen in your lifetime, Joshua. It's going to be for the next generation to, to try. But your job was still to divide the entire land. So God has, uh, the point I'm making here is God has Joshua divide all the promised land and give it as an inheritance to the nation of Israel, to the different tribes in Israel, before they even possess it all. I mean, that shows, you know, that, you know, God, you know, God's not wishy-washy about things. If God promises something, he's going to do it. And even though he hasn't done it yet, he still divides the land as if it's theirs already. And so I want to go over um, why that is. Hold your place in Joshua. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Because you say, well, if God promised all this land to the nation of Israel. He's certainly with them. He's given them the victory in the south and north over Jericho, all these different territories. Why are these? Why is there still very much land to be possessed? Why doesn't God just give to 